Today we are going to talk about five controlling mental faculties. What it means is we are practicing this mindfulness insight meditation. And when we practice, okay, there's always the mind, of course. It is the work of the mind. In the mind, there's two parts, what we call mind. One part is called consciousness, which is simply an ability to know or to be aware. Bare awareness, nothing extra. That's called consciousness or jeta. And another part is called mental associates or mental co-committance. And that is just loosely put all the emotions that we express and experience, plus many more non-emotional factors too. As an example, mindfulness is the one of them. Concentration is one of them. Okay. Some are not emotions, but in general, let's call it emotions. These two parts, consciousness and mental factors, together is called the mind. And these two, they arise together, they disappear together. They cannot arise one without the other. But between the two, the consciousness, jeta, is the leader. When the consciousness arises, this mental factors arises. Altogether, there are 52 mental factors the Buddha has taught us. And not all 52 arise together with a consciousness. Some arises, some do not. They have their own little grouping. Just to clarify with simplicity, if you feel love, love is a mental factor. If you are feeling love, at that moment you cannot feel hate at all. If you are feeling hate, you can't feel love at all. Those both are mental factors, but they cannot coexist together. Just like that, in this 52 do, a certain mental factors could arise with a consciousness, some arises with another consciousness. So, these are 52 mental factors. I won't go much detail than that. The point is, we are talking about this five controlling mental faculties. These five controlling mental faculties are five of the, this 52, five of the 52. And they are called five controlling mental faculties because if you develop these things, okay, if you develop these certain mental factors, if one is in dominance, all other mental factors fall behind them and follow it. They have the power to control the remaining. There are five they have the power to control all other mental factors that arise together with it. They fall behind, they listen, they operate under the instruction of these mental factors. So what are these five? The first one, I'll start with English. It's also called verifiable faith or confidence, English translation. In Pali, it's called sadha, verifiable faith or confidence or sadha. Second one is effort or energy, 
Pali word is Varya. And the third one is mindfulness. That is Sati. And the fourth one is mental concentration. And that is Samadhi. And the last one is insight or wisdom. Pinya. Those five are mental factors or mental associates. Those are five out of the 52. And when you develop them, whenever one is become in charge or in control, the rest all follows. Not only these, all others that arises together, they have to listen, they have to obey to the power of these mental states. They have a controlling faculties, but only it's in their own territory, not one in the other territory. To make an example, okay, the Prime Minister of Canada and the President of United States. Now forget about this guy because the example may not be quite good. The Prime Minister of Canada and the Prime Minister of United Kingdom. When that Prime Minister of UK came to Canada, he listened to the Prime Minister of Canada and conduct and operate according to the direction of Canadian Prime Minister. And the same thing when Canadian Prime Minister goes to UK, he has to follow etiquettes and structures and programs set out by the UK Prime Minister. But they are each boss in their own place. But whenever one is in the other domain, they follow the lead of the domain leader. So the idea is, if faith and confidence is the strongest, the other four follow their lead in their domain. If the wisdom is the most dominant and the strongest, the other four follows that lead. That's the idea. They each have the controlling, governing power, but they are the strongest in their own domain, not at others' domain. So that one should be aware. That's what it means by five controlling mental faculties. They are the supreme in their domain, in their territory. So let's touch the first one, which is, we call it verifiable faith or confidence. Sada, the first one. This sada, if you translate it, is simply faith. But we need to know, because Western understanding of faith, the meaning of faith is different. You believed. Whether there's proof or no proof, you blindly believe, simply believe. No argument, nothing, no logic, no reason, rational, blind faith. That is, in general, how faith is understood, blind faith. But Buddhism too, there's a faith. Because nobody knows anything before they experience it. So if one is okay, thinking about something that you haven't experienced and you believe in it, at that point, it is the simply like a blind faith. And even with that, of course, nowadays is different. We have books and CDs and videos and Googles and everything. We can always investigate theoretically in terms of words or in terms of sound. 
or even with the pictures, we can investigate intellectually. So you have a certain degree of understanding and you believe in it. So that is faith. If you don't know anything and you believe, that is faith. But at the same time, whatever you blindly believe in, you explore and investigate through your words, books, and videos, and CDs, and so on. You use your intelligence. Oh, it's sensible. You believe. But your belief has some support behind you, some reason and rational behind you. That's faith. And then in Buddhism too, you will see a lot of things while you are practicing. If you talk right now, it will be hard to believe, hard to comprehend. It will be simply talking round and round and arguing and debating and never ending. But one thing is in Buddhism, you put that into practice because it is not blindly put down a law or a line or a belief or a formula. There's always a procedure to verify it. The Buddhists give procedures and formula to verify it. If we follow the procedure and if we utilize that formula, we can actually verify that blind belief into the actual experiential fact. In Buddhism, that structure is always there. That's why Sada is interpreted as verifiable faith, a faith that can be verified by yourself. So that is the meaning of faith. Okay. Or some people translate as confidence your level of confidence grow and grow and grow. Because faith in Buddhism is not constant. It can increase, it can decrease. But if you properly follow the procedure, it will be on the upswing on the right. You believe today, a month later of your practice, you even believe more. And three months later, you are a total believer. The degree of your belief changes. That's a variation in your belief. That's why sadda, faith, is not constant. Not one big block, never changing. It's always changing. And at the same time, if you dropped it, you become drifted and far apart. Your belief becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. It is not static, it is dynamic, it is changing. That is Buddhist faith. Translate as verifiable faith or confidence. So that is the first thing. And that is very important, this faith or belief. Because this faith or belief is the beginning of everything you do. I'm not talking about having a breakfast, drinking a cup of coffee. Whatever you consider worthwhile to do, whatever cause you believe in, you believe in climate change, you believe in saving the forest, you believe in protesting the bad government, believe, believe, believe. Because these are important to you. These issues are worthwhile for you to pursue. Okay, these are the issues. And when you really believe into the issue, everything changes. Before it's, ah, okay, sounds good. Ah, that's so fantastic. And that's it. After that discussion, you went away. You don't pursue anything. You do not have faith in it. You are intellectually accepted. That's right, I accept that explanation. But when you believe, when you have sadha, 
when you have faith in the cause, it changes everything. You dogmatically follow that cause, pursuit of that cause. You work for the cause. You prevent for the cause not to fall. You promote that cause. Everything just escalate. Where does it start? With the sada, faith. That kind of strength it has. That kind of strength and power that mental states can give a person. When you believe, when you have faith, when you have sada in something, it just escalate. That is why everything worthwhile pursuing that you consider worthwhile pursuing all starts. Starting point is what? Sada, faith and confidence. When you have this, you are on a roll. Nobody can stop you. You will not be standing still. You will be pushing and pushing and pushing. That's the power of sada, or faith and confidence. That's one. We know now what sada is, and we know now what it can do to a person if you have that mental factor holding you right at the top along with it. And it will keep you as an outstanding it will give you an outstanding position in that circle because of that faith and confidence. So that's what faith is. We know what it does and we know what it gives. I'm talking in general, of course. Now we are doing meditation, specifically meditation that's taught by the Buddha mindfulness insight meditation. So we have to apply this sada in context with this meditation. Mindfulness insight meditation taught by the Buddha around 2,600 years ago. So in here it's very become specific. Okay. You can categorize. What is it? What do you have a faith in. Let's start with Dhamma or Dharma. Dharma is a Sanskrit sounding. Dhamma is a Pali sounding. They are the same. Dhamma, Dharma. Dharma. What is Dharma? In general, of course, you say Buddhist teachings is Dharma. Okay. For us, very specific. What is it? Yes, Buddhist teaching but we are specifically narrowing and zooming down to mindfulness insight meditation. This mindfulness insight meditation is Dhamma. We are practicing this Dhamma and we are living according to this Dhamma. So basically it's Dhamma and in fact this is the essence of Buddhism, mindfulness insight. If you want the goal or objective set out or can be attained by this mindfulness insight meditation. If you want the result or the goal of this, this is utterly necessary. And it is the quintessential of Buddhism. And that is the method only taught by the Buddha in this world up to this period. So we are practicing this mindfulness insight meditation. So if you are practicing this mindfulness insight meditation, if you do not believe in it, if you don't have faith in it, if you don't have confidence in it, and you are practicing, basically you're wasting your own time you rather pack it up and go to the beach and play volleyball. That might be better. Rather than sitting and practicing without any confidence in it. That's what it is. 
what kind of faith and confidence you have to have in, you must have into the Dharma. I start with Dharma. The reason is because this is what you are practicing and you already know. You have already investigated in terms of books and in terms of videos and in some lectures and stuff to a reasonable degree and you have already practiced to a certain degree so you know things are unfolding as you understood. That gives you confidence. And that faith and confidence in Dharma is absolutely necessary because otherwise you're wasting your time. Secondly, who taught this? Dhamma. The Buddha taught that. So we need to have faith and confidence in the Buddha. So what is Buddha? Buddha is not a god. Buddha is not a supreme being. Buddha is a historical figure. About 2,600 years ago, he was born, he practiced, and he discovered this method, and it is very beneficial to him. He has lived in happiness and peace without physical and mental suffering affecting him. First hand. And then, because of that, he decided to turn around and teach anybody and everybody who would like that result. That is Buddha. The thing is, he discovered this matter on his own without a teacher. And he reaped the benefit of this practice. It is effective and good. He turns around and teach. Historical account will give you that he really exists. It's not a legend, not a his, not a myth. As such, one need to have faith and confidence in the Buddha. So you have faith and confidence in Buddha and Dharma, and then Sangha. What is Sangha? Sangha is a, a group of people who devoted their life totally in practicing this and learning this Dhamma. The monks, they will go to the, they might spend, just like you spend about 20, 25 years of your life to get a bachelor degree, they spend, they go and learn the scriptures and go one level to the other to get a degree called Dhammacharya. Dhamma, you know what it means. Jariya means teacher. Okay. They become, the knowledge become the level that they could be a teacher. And theoretically, and also that is only one aspect. They have to practice meditation. And practically they also progress to a certain level, to a certain extent. And at that moment, okay, your teacher decided when you can teach. And if you become a teacher, you will decide who can teach. In other words, your graduation is not from certificate. It's from the teacher to student, teacher to student. And any student that excels, follow the first step. And that is Sangha who devote 100% of their life in learning, practicing Dharma. And when they reach to a certain level, they turn around and help all others who want to learn. Not you don't push them to them, you don't force them to learn. Whoever comes to you, you welcome with an open arm and teach everything without leaving any secret. There's no such thing as secret. All Buddha Dharma are open, free, and transparent. If anybody say that it's a secret method, that's not what Buddha said, or Buddhas intend to. 
all Buddha dharmas are free for public. All that you need is you need to choose a teacher that you have confidence in. That's all. So, believing in Buddha, believing in Dharma, believing in Sangha, that is Sada, belief, faith, and confidence. Now, one more. One more is you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have a belief in yourself. If you don't believe it, no, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can overcome the pain. I don't think this is, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think. And if you are doing with that, there's nobody can help you. Only you can help yourself. I can do it. I won't give up. I will do what's necessary to proceed it. Again, not blindly. Step by step, every step of the way you are verifying your experience and the teachings, putting together, putting together, putting together, are they unfolding? Are my experience unfolding as it's being taught or written and expressed by the scriptures or taught by the teacher who you have confidence in, Sangha? So, belief in yourself. Confidence in yourself. That's the fourth sada you need. And one more. Belief in karma vipaka, the law of cause and effect. Simply put, if you do good things, good result will follow. Immediately, a little later, a lot later, or in many future lives. And if you do bad things, unwholesome things, bad result will follow. The same thing, it could be immediate or it could be many lives after, but it is with you. So that is karma. Wholesome deeds produce wholesome effect, unwholesome deeds produce unwholesome effect. Wholesome deeds does not cancel out unwholesome. Unwholesome deeds does not cancel out wholesome. They have their own path, parallel path. You pay your dues, you reap your result. And nobody can reap that result or go stand in front of you to pay the dues. Only you can. It only belongs to you. Karma or the actions are your own, your own responsibility, and their result, potentiality, stays along with that track. It doesn't go on to anybody. Cause and effect, cause and effect. Wholesome produce, wholesome result, good result. Unwholesome deeds produce unwholesome results or bad results. Just a matter of time. That's why karma is the only true property that you own. Good or bad, you'll get it back right away, you'll back it out next life, or you can get it, we'll get it back a hundred lives later. Only with you, that is the only inheritance you have only property you have. No other property goes with you. Only that potentiality of karma, of your actions. What actions? In actions in terms of thoughts, actions in terms of speech, actions in terms of deeds, wholesome or unwholesome. That was the driving engine that will keep on driving, that will keep on going round and round and round and round, never ending. That creates sansara, cycle of birth and death and birth and death and birth and death, never ending. As long as there's a birth, there's a death. As long as you have a life, that life is full of physical and mental pain.
And if you want to get out of that cycle of life and death, you must practice so that there is first stages, no unwholesome actions are done or only wholesome actions are produced. That's the first level. And second level is you go to the stage of total equanimity, neither wholesome or unwholesome, neither left nor right, up or down, totally balanced. Simply you live as a function, nothing more, nothing less. At that moment, these Karma has no power to produce. And that is the end of the cycle of birth and death, Nibbana. So to do that, the starting point is Sada, faith and confidence. Faith and confidence in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, oneself, and the law of karma, Vipaka cause and effects. That's the starting point of everything. And this particular pursuit for the elimination of physical and mental pain and attaining Nibbana. So may all of you be able to practice Satipatthana Vipassana meditation precisely and correctly and devote yourself to this practice with full of sada, faith and confidence. And may you be able to escalate quickly in the progress and attain Nibbana as soon as possible. Sadhu, 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 buddham Dhammam Jemi Sangam Jemi Thank you very much.